the first scared straight probe at Rahway State Prison. She came to Akron in 81 to teach at the university's Department of Criminal Justice. At Akron, Carol helped found the Women's Studies Program, became a founding director. She was one of the founders, there seems to be a pattern here. She was one of the founders of the Women's History Project of the Akron area, served as on the board of the Rape Crisis Center, the National Women's Studies Association, and was appointed by President Bush to the U.S. Defense Department's Committee on Women in the Service, and then to the committee's executive board by President Clinton. She was associate director of the Kent State University of Akron Institute for the Study of Gender and Education, member of the National Council for Research on Women. She was the first co-vice chair of Ohio State's Women's Commission. She served on the Research Advisory Board for the Ohio Department of Corrections and the Summit County Domestic Violence Task Force. <laughs> in 92, Carol joined the UN peacekeeping mission in Cambodia to supervise that country's first democratic election in history. For 13 months, she lived in a remote village, set up polling stations, and supervised the registration of voters. In 93, she returned to Akron to teach, but three years later, she was back in Cambodia as executive director of the Cooperation Committee for Cambodia, a network of humanitarian and developmental NGOs. While in Cambodia, Carol adopted Teddy. <laughs> After retiring from the University of Akron, Carol went on to chair the Department of Criminal Justice and Police Studies here at EKU. Carol. When you're nervous, you have to pee, at least I do, every five minutes. And I couldn't believe the extension and how gorgeous oh, this building yes. has become. And so it's really with joy. It's like seeing a child, you know, your niece or nephew you haven't seen for five years, and you go, oh, Kevin, how big you've grown. And so it's, oh, you use how big you've grown and how beautiful. It's also nice to see old friends. But it's really nice to see new faces. Um, and hopefully, maybe by the end of today, we'll be friends too, because I think that's what being a storyteller is about. As you know, if you are, I'm missing something, no, I'm not. If you are um, a person like me and you get the podium and you get the mic, you get the power. And so you get to say lots of things. Uh, and there are a couple of people in this room who like the mic and like the podium as much as I do, and we haven't always gotten along. It's a big fight over the power. I'm going to talk about my book, this book. Um, this is a funny kind of memoir, as you'll find out, that's just recently been published, but my publisher has gone bankrupt, and you probably collected more money in the donation plate than I'll ever see from this book, even though it's selling. There's no way for me to get the money. Uh, but we'll talk about that in a minute. One of the books that I really had hoped this congregate, this fellowship would get involved with is an anthology by the same publisher. This anthology is called, What Does It Mean to Be White in America? Conversations and Personal Narratives mostly by people like us who have, over their life, had those aha moments where they realize either their own racism or white privilege and whiteness. And I couldn't get your program committee to agree to 
do this book or bring this book here. And there's a woman in Berea, her name is Wendy Warren, who also has an uh, essay in this book. So I'm hoping if you don't want to hear from me again, maybe you'll invite Wendy to come up to Richmond and share this with you. So I wrote lots of things for a couple of weeks. I, I wound up Running for a school board in Cabell County. This is not something you do at 75. This is really a dumb thing to do. But it was the last day of filing, and I had gone to volunteer to counsel returning veterans on their choices about education. And of course, if you know the US government, they do not accept volunteers. They are terrified, threatened, if you will, of volunteers. And I was so angry, and it was the last day for filing. I crossed the street to the courthouse, plunked down $25, and filed to run in the 3rd District of Cabell County for the school board. <laughs> I was tired of them handing out Bibles to my kids on the first day of class, and principals calling and saying, I know you all don't celebrate Christmas the same way, and I thought, idiot, we don't celebrate Christmas, we're Jewish. Um, anyway, turns out, I didn't plan to campaign. I wasn't going to buy one yard sign or spend one penny. I'm in fact leaving for a trip around the world, a trek actually around the world, for three months. But nobody ran against me. So be careful what you do. So I was writing this and answering candidate questions for the local newspaper, and they uh, asked me to write a column and then warned me not to write it above an eighth grade reading level. So the real column I'd like to write about is the dumbing down of, but I didn't, I wrote something else. But anyway, so in between, I'm trying to figure out how to talk about this. Because at its heart, it's self-promotion, right? I'm promoting a book. Now, it's nice that I'm not making money off this book. Um, but on the other hand, when you commit to running naked in the street, which is what a memoir is, then you want people to read it. So there's a self-promoting kind of part of this. And I'm sure Marianne has gotten the multiple Facebook and emails saying, Go to Amazon and buy this book. <laughs> so I didn't know how to talk about this book. Uh, you know, in a way, this isn't an academic. What did, what did um, last night I was at Ann's house and, and uh, we were talking about this. And, uh, you know, we were talking about how do you approach this? Do, do these stories talk to me? And this morning I woke up because I didn't sleep last night. I thought about, do these stories talk to me? And the real question is, do these stories talk to you? Are these stories going to talk to people? Are these stories going to have value? And so, you know, on one hand, as an academic, I'm thinking about, you know, calling up Aristotle's mandate that an unexamined life is not worth living. Well, what, how do you examine your life? if you don't reflect on it and write it. Um, and then I actually heard a philosopher talking and criticizing Socrates, Aristotle, no, Socrates. Socrates. Who is that? Socrates for being too harsh. So even if you don't write about your life, it doesn't mean your life wasn't any good, except how are you going to know because you haven't examined it. And so, you know, do I talk about how to get published? Oh my god. If you really want to get published and you're not Hillary Clinton, it doesn't happen unless you are absolutely either the luckiest or most, most brilliant person in the world or well-known or something. And there are so many voices out there that aren't published, that have something to say, that we'll never hear from because the whole idea of publishing is just beyond, but that's another story for another day. So let me go through, and I'm going to kind of weave in and out of the stories in this book. I'm certainly not going to read you this book. I'm going to hope that you will want to read it for yourself. Uh, but I want to kind of talk about not only how it got written, 
uh, what that means, but some of the stories to kind of see if they connect. Because really the power of words is the power of connection. And I'm always struck by, there was a, a woman being interviewed on NPR, God I wish, um, and she was, it was a, a memoir about abortion. And she said the most important thing for her was to have finally heard somebody who gives advice or was talking about to admit to having had an abortion that it was somebody telling their narrative, their personal story, that they had experienced that, that helped her to feel like she could make a decision for herself, that she wasn't the only one out there, that she wasn't going to stand alone and be judged. So I think when we share our stories, even if they're not great literature, those stories, even if they're just a variation on human, the story of humanity, our story is still unique and can create a bridge or a connection to somebody else. Now, I'm fabulously lucky, fabulously lucky. My life and serendipity has had all kinds of events in it. I mean, you don't get to do all the things that Jack talked about, although, trust me, resumes have a life of their own and they're more fiction than they are fact. Um, you have to live a long time, so I'm 75, so I've got that going for me. I could have several different lives. Um, and I've always been open then to reinvent myself or run away from home, however it happened. Mostly I was running away from home when something new happened. Um, it wasn't so much me as it was uh, serendipity. Anyway, Socrates demands that we tell our own story. And I had written a memoir of my first year in Cambodia. It was pretty hairy. Uh, I went into the jungle and I taught gorillas how to vote a secret ballot while they were trying to figure out how to cut my feet off and take my cowboy boots. Um, and so I had kept a diary. I don't know how many of you keep a journal or a diary or at least send out a Christmas letter, right? <laughs> You can't write a memoir of 75 years if you haven't written anything down. But I'm, I'm a writer, so I'm not, not a great literature writer, but I, I write things. Because it's how I then can understand what has just happened. So it's my process. Anyway, I started to write this <coughs> memoir of this year in Cambodia and sent it out to 50 or 100 or 200 agents and nothing. So then I turned this memoir into a novel. This is a great way to hide from the truth. You get to embellish the truth in any way that makes you even more exciting than other people are convinced you are that don't know you really well. Um, and you're not naked. You have clothes on because you can pretend that's not really you at all. That's just that character in the novel. Another hundred agents, another thanks, but no thanks. Well, in the meantime, I'm writing essays. And in those essays came out this book by this publisher in New York who is a minority publisher who does things around racism and discrimination and social justice. And I got, uh, so I have an essay in that book. That was very exciting. That book also hasn't sold, but it's a good book. People should read it. Anyway, about the time that our current president was the president-elect and was spouting all this vain old rhetoric about immigrants, I decided to kind of run away and go to, uh, to Toronto to visit my Tibetan immigrant friends. You, some of you may remember when we brought them over from Nepal to be reunited with their husband in Tibet. You guys laundered my money, so it was tax deductible. Thank you very much. <laughs> I ran to Toronto to make sure that my immigrant friends were safe 
and thriving and get away from the madness that I saw descending on America. And I wrote a story. This wasn't the story I planned to read first. I'm going to read it to you now, if I can find it, which is interesting because where is it? Here it is. And I probably need my glasses, so if you'll bear with me. Anybody see them? Good sign. Good sign. I, you know, glasses. I'll borrow any glasses. Marco. Yeah, those are, those are my glasses, aren't they? <laughs> they do look like them. That's what I get for trying to sing with Chi Chi. Okay, so this, these are good. Because you never there, these are, these are fine. This little story, which is in actually a section of this book um, about sort of aha moments in my life. Those are those moments that we have every once in a while when we're not looking for it, when life teaches us a lesson if we think about it. And it has, this is what it said. I sit studying the tiny chestnut colored roach for a long moment, a mix of revulsion and irrational fear pricking across the back of my neck. When I see its antenna twitching, I realize it's studying me. We are joined in a contest to see who will move first. It stays frozen on the pale green wall, just above the white ceramic tile with its stained and yellow grout. I tighten my hands into a fist and will my foot not to tap the floor. I decide to concentrate on why I have such a strong emotional reaction to this tiny bug, not more than the size of a thumbnail. Unlike me, it's no threat. Packed inside my response to this tiny creature, however, is a dark abyss of fear and guilt. Roaches have, been, have managed to sustain their species for more than 320 million years and have existed in human lore since classical antiquity. This little one, generally gregarious by nature, is probably desperate to escape and return to its multitudinous kin, who I'm certain inhabit the warmer areas of this tenement that I was living in. Like the varied immigrants who live here, roaches are popularly described in the U.S. and, and depicted as dirty pests, difficult to get rid of, though the great majority of species like the majority of immigrants, are inoffensive and live in a wide range of habitats all over the world. When Karma was born a few years ago, that's not right, my roach doesn't move, save for the occasional spasm of its antenna. The bathroom light is on and it's waiting for the cover of darkness to escape. Perhaps it doesn't want me to see the doorway to its root. In any case, my fear subsides and my thoughts turn to the connection of this creature to the financial and physical poverty of the home where I'm a guest. My senses recreate the clash of smells in the halls at dinner time. Pungent curries, savory soups, fresh bread, and hot cooking oil seeping through the thin doors of the more than 50 apartments on each floor of this eight-story building. I hear the loud scraping of furniture on the floor above being moved by its occupants from one corner to another as, as beds and tables are rearranged in preparation to sleep or eat in their tiny efficiency. I think of the tinfoil sheets Sonam and her neighbors hang to protect the kitchen walls from the grease of the cooking oil that's used to make almost everything the families in this building eat. And finally, I picture the gray street windows, muddied with fog and smog from the heavily traveled city street below. My attention returns to roaches, like this one, which is not just a synonym for poverty. They may be ubiquitous in old, rundown houses like those in this neighborhood, but they live in parallel to the humanity that also inhabits these dwellings. Roaches have an intricate social structure involving shared shelter, social dependence, communication, even kin recognition. 
When Karma was born a few years ago, the family gave up the tiny room that had been used as the shrine to the Buddha and turned it into a second bedroom for the little boy. The three girls, now well out of their teens, still share the larger bedroom, leaving Sonan and her husband Kasan, who work opposite shifts, to sleep on a couch amidst the clutter of the sitting room. The dining area is devoted to Karma's toys, his bikes, his strollers, as well as kitchen supplies. When most everyone is home, the couch and settees are heaped with many arms and legs, each, each set of hands holding some sort of electrical, electronic device. The flat screen TV shows only Netflix and YouTube, as no local channels are paid for. An iPad propped up against the book is continuously connected to Sonan's elderly parents' home in Kathmandu, so that anyone can chat as the urge strikes. Occasionally there's a squeal of laughter, some jostling, so that an iPad or a phone can be passed around and lots of elbowing before everyone gets comfortable again, using each other for warmth and connection. Rice and a stack of flatbread are in bowls, dishes, spoons, scrupulously washed a second time when taken from the cupboards, because of the roaches, lay haphazardly on the bench that serves as a coffee table. The fragrance of sandalwood, sandalwood, moves through the apartment as incense smoke curls up from the Buddha shrine, which now occupies a quarter of the living area, and karma complains, smells like bug spray. I'm with them, and I am a part, half family member, half guest. I am mostly with them during family discussions and games, or endlessly playing with karma. I'm a guest when the next day's chores, schedules, and responsibilities are assigned. When we go to celebrate the Dalai Lama's winning of the 1989 Nobel Peace Prize, still a cause to celebrate some 27 years later, I wear clothes in the colors most like Tibetan monks' robes, orange and magenta, but my round eyes and my light hair give me away. Tomorrow I will leave them. Sonam already insists that they call an Uber to take me to the Toronto airport. Although I know the family will return home by trolley and a couple of buses, still needing to be frugal with every penny in the communal pot, the children's lives full of hardships don't appear to be much different from the pretty girl with the quick smile and flashing eyes whom I met weaving rugs in a Tibetan refugee camp in Nepal. But they are. Gaki already has a nurse's degree, and Tashi, the image of her mother as a young woman, is a semester away from graduating in hospitality management. Dechen, a typical college sophomore, still flounders between her passions and the practicalities of life. Probably a good thing I was going to the bathroom a long time. The room seems brighter than when I first noticed my quiet companion. The roach has not moved, as if it's glued to the wall. I gather a paper towel in a ball, screwing up the courage to squish it. It's antennae twitch, a signal for help, for compassion. At that moment, I think of Trump, president-elect of the United States, and his strident anti-immigrant comments. Those who buy his rhetoric would squish this family in the same way that I'm contemplating killing this roach. So I don't. <laughs> so these stories, which really, um, so this story comes home with me. I write it on the plane. I write it up. Um, I edit it. I send it out to some close friends as my Christmas, as my Christmas message. And for some reason, I send it to this publisher of that anthology. A month later, I had a contract, a ticket to Cambodia, which I bought because I was going, and four months to write stories. Stories. So I get to Cambodia, and basically I wrote 70 stream of consciousness stories. Now, I had just finished working for four years on a memoir novel of Cambodia. So, two-thirds of this book are stories of Cambodia. 
but they're like the story of Roach. They all stretch back the history of my life. My time in Toronto was based on a time years ago when I first met this young Tibetan refugee in this rug, rug, uh, whatever, and she was weaving a rug. I was a rug weaver before arthritis got my hands, and we connected. And then through those years, bringing them to Canada, watching those kids, you know, grow up and become, you know, educated, productive people. When I was with them in that little teeny tiny bathroom in that roach, that story had already been written. All I had to do was put it on paper. And so many of the stories in this memoir are just stories that just flowed from head to pen to paper. But it's a good thing it was computer because if it had been the yellow legal pads that I used in the 80s, it would have had a dump truck full of, you know, balled up paper. Um, so I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. And in June, the 70 stories were done. Some were stories that had been written and re-edited. And I had to think about what is a memoir. Unlike that fiction where you could hide your story, a memoir is supposed to be truth. Not truth like scientific truth, <coughs> but truth. You're not supposed to make up the stories of your life. And so, one, all the stories went to two editors. Who knew I was that illiterate that I needed two editors, but I did. And so the stories came back and then we had to organize it. Well, these stories didn't seem related. There were stories about when I was a cop, stories about when I was a kid, stories about incest and abortion, stories about marriage disasters, stories about being a mother, stories about being a daughter, stories about being a teacher. Wow, how are these going to make sense? And then the worst that running naked in the street, there were stories I wasn't sure I wanted anybody to know. But they were important stories. And so it was like, if you gave somebody a jigsaw of a thousand pieces, but held back a hundred, what kind of present would that be? <laughs> what would it mean to people if you were putting this out as your story and held back those things that haunted you all your life? and help make you who you were. So there was one story in particular, it was a story of childhood incest, and let me tell you, this story lasted and probably continues on into my 70s because it's a taboo in this society, and it's not a story that you share, but it is a story that affects you and influences you all your life in your social interactions, the way you look at sexuality, the way you look at trusting people. So I made the decision that I would share that story. But if I shared the story in the absolute truth the way you would write it in a diary, the children of my youthful abuser, who are now grown women, would have to share my shame. They would have to be exposed in the same way I was willing to expose myself, and I couldn't do that. Now, there are two stories about my ex-husbands that show that, how, what assholes they were, and I didn't decide they deserved any help there. I just put those stories right out there. And they're in the book. That's all I gave them was two short stories, but I didn't change them. But I have to think about this story about my incest and about my cousins whose father was my abuser and if this story is read by their neighbor in Chicago oh my god you know it's got my name on it isn't that your cousin like was that your father that wasn't fair and so after I wrote this and decided what goes in and I decided everything goes in I had to then go through another process of pulling out from that what was the story I could share so that somebody else who had suffered what I suffered could feel supported and connected without punishing people who had no part of it. And 
you know, I'm very, you know, you, you find ways. And the CDC sent me a uh, survey about uh, domestic violence, and part of it was something about early incest, and I used that as the cover for my story. It was still true. So a memoir is a truth that is kind of made better than the true story, I guess, in a way. So that was part of the process of going through the writing of this uh, of this book and putting it together. So we put it together. There are three journals about Cambodia. So that was fine because those were good stories and they follow the thing. And then there were stories about my childhood and stories about the aha moments and stories about some of my journeys where I discovered things in strange places, not only about strange places, but about me. And uh, I had never intended to dedicate this book to my mother. Moms are moms. Now, my mom had a very good run. She lasted 99 years without a cane. I mean, she was, we never lost her to the day we lost her. And, okay, so my mom's my mom, and I'm, good, I have a great mom. She wasn't who I was going to dedicate the story to, this memoir. But as I reread all of these stories, I realized that my mother had been there through them all through everyone, sometimes good, sometimes not good, but she was there, she was there in Cambodia, asking me, what are you thinking, adopting a kid at 55? And my answer was, mom, if I had thought about it, I wouldn't do it, but <laughs> me or a brothel, what do you want me to do? She was there, she came in her 80s to meet her new uh, granddaughter. My mother was there through the incest stuff. In the beginning, not a happy story. Later on, I understood because she had suffered her own and nobody helped her. And I learned how to forgive, which is something that took me 50 years to do. Anyway, so I'm reading through this book and all of a sudden I say to the publisher, well, I guess I'm gonna dedicate this book to my mom. So this next story is just one of the stories that flowed from consciousness, that wound up in the book, but that made me understand why my mother was my, as the book is dedicated to, my constant companion. No wheelchair. I'm not going to be pushed around like a toddler, she said. <clears throat> Her stoop frame silhouetted against the bright vista of the mountains and the blue skies of Window Rock, Arizona. Really, Mom, don't be so stubborn. It's easier to cover the museum, I said, pushing a wheelchair in her direction. But I can walk. It's embarrassing, she replied. Ignoring her protests, I clicked my tongue impatiently while helping her to sit down in the chair. The Navajo Nation Museum was a beautiful art center, but it was very large, and it contained many galleries full of contemporary art and ethnic history. I wanted to explore it all, but after several days of slow going to accommodate my mother's shuffling gait, I decided that using a wheelchair provided for guests was a great idea. Mom smiled up at me, camouflaging her resignation to her plight. I patted her hand and smiled back. I wasn't giving in, and if she wouldn't cooperate, I wasn't offering her any options. It was for her own good. We began our mobile tour in the portrait gallery. It was stunning to see the faces with likenesses of my Tibetan friends who lived half a planet away staring at me from these framed portraits. I forgot about mom and wandered off without her. <laughs> hey, she called. Sorry, mom, it won't happen again. I went and retrieved, the, retrieved her. I kissed her lightly on the cheek and apologized. We moved to the galleries full of artifacts of struggle, resistance, death, survival. The high vaulted ceiling sent beams of light down to the floor below. One beam illuminated my mother as she read a famous Native as she read famous Native American quotes that lined the desert red walls. You should remember 
remember this one young lady, she said, pointing to a short quote on a plaque above a bronze warrior standing over a dead grizzly. Force, no matter how concealed, begets resistance, Lakota. I'm not forcing you to use the wheelchair. I just want getting around easier for you. Huh. Then I saw it, a Pueblo quote, a few yards further down the wall. Hold on to my hand, even if someday I'll be gone from you. Mom saw it too, and looked meanfully up to me. <laughs> I reached out my hand, she took it, pulled herself up, a museum guide took the wheelchair away. Mom pulled back her shoulders, looked around to see who might be watching, and letting me take her hand in mine, continued slowly through the exhibits. Sorry, I couldn't memorize 70 stories, although I know I'm like the back of my hand because they're my stories. I'm not sure if we covered every exhibit, but we saw enough. Mom had a good laugh when I had to park myself on a bench to catch my breath. We chatted easily face to face. It was much better than looking down at the top of her head while she sat in the wheelchair. I was glad she had resisted. I was glad she had reclaimed her independence. I also discovered something else that day. Not just her strength, but also her increasing vulnerability. Her hands, soft and plump, had always held mine. Crossing a busy street, maneuvering through a crowded store, entering a classroom for the first time. But that day in the museum, it was I who held her hand in mine. It was my hand supporting her, reassuring her, protecting her. What is life? It is the flash of a firefly in the night. It is the breath of a buffalo in winter time. It is the little shadow which runs across the grass and loses itself in the sunset. Blackfoot. Oh, yeah. These stories just kept coming. And as they came, and it wasn't until I reflected back that I realized my mother had been my constant companion. And so the book just naturally became dedicated to her. I'm going to speed up because we are running out of time. There was one I wanted to read very much. It's called The Kindness of Strangers, and I'll let you read it along by yourself someday. It is very much a part of this memoir. That is my journey to understanding social justice. My journey to understanding that goodness is not the providence of white people. That, and, and how through these experiences, sometimes being the teacher and sometimes being the learner, I really came to understand humanity and the importance of reaching out and inclusiveness and why we must always struggle for that fight. But I'm not going to read that one. I'm going to read something else because it's a way to end this, a way that ends it where it's an ending and a beginning. And this is a story that starts in Cambodia a long, long time ago. It starts somewhere, if I can find it, uh, a pilgrim's journey. Here it is. Okay. So it starts in Cambodia. Actually, the very first time I was there, I met a money seller who happened to be very good at languages. And so she spoke English. And I am very poor at languages. And so I spoke no Khmer. And so she became my friend. And we were friends then in Cambodia. I went to her wedding. And then when I came back three years later, we became almost like sisters. Uh, and she always claimed real or not, that I was her luck in Cambodia. The three years I was gone, there were some pretty serious things. And she was a child who had survived the labor camps of Pol Pot. And, and then when I left, she had gotten pregnant and unfortunately lost that baby. When I came back, she had a healthy baby girl named May May, who used to bathe at my house uh, when it was too hot for anything else. I've got my glasses on, they're making me dizzy. Okay, so her name is Hun. Ho, and this story starts, not back then, but this story starts on my last trip to Cambodia on my annual pilgrimage to Hun's family. 
Hoping that one of Hun's sisters would recognize me, I leaned my face out of the car window as my driver, Kim Soar, slowly drove down the crowded row of cell phone stores. No matter how many times over the years I had visited Hun's family, I could never remember the shop's address and only vaguely remembered the general location. Kim Soar was prepared to go from store to store with Hun's story until someone could get us to the right place. No need. I saw a face light up with recognition almost immediately. It belonged to a younger sister, nicknamed Thiep, who bore a remarkable resemblance to her sister Han. Before Kim Soar came to a complete stop, I leapt from the car and ran to embrace Thiep. I leaned in over the counter, ignoring her bewildered customer, and kissed her face. Our hands fluttered as we tried to touch to connect, to hug. Our greetings were noisy, gushing mixture of Khmer and English. Thiep came around from behind the counter, leaving her customer to unwillingly observe our reunion. As we stood, our hands clasped tightly together. I said the words I repeated so many times over the years. I come so you know, I never forget your sister. At that moment, a great weight heaved against my chest and my tears came quickly and violently. It had been 19 years since Hun had begged me not to leave her, not to leave Cambodia, that I was her luck in Cambodia. It had been 19 years since I received the phone call telling me that she had been murdered. Oh. I had been coming back to Phnom Penh every few years ever since then, each time finding her family and seeking absolution each time expecting it to be easier. It never is. Thiep's eyes were sad, but she smiled and she said, we never forget you. We know your heart. The tears stopped like a spring rain passing quickly, or lately a spring snowball. Staining, and I wiped my hand against my eyes, staining my fingers black. For some reason, seeing the wet mascara made me feel better. After a few more sniffs, I regained my composure and I asked Thiep about the rest of the family, about Han's husband and daughter, Meme, who now lived in Paris, and about, of course, herself. Her English was good enough to get the gist of my questions. Everybody was carpeny. Everybody was fine. We joked about the time I had taken her and her sisters to the elegant Safatel Hotel back in 1996, a happier time a time before the political coup, before I left Cambodia for the safety of the U.S. They had spent a half an hour in the ladies' room because they thought it was the most beautiful room they had ever seen. As she joined me in remembering that special evening, Thiep's tinkling laughter was like a soothing balm. Thiep invited me to dinner, but I declined. I had completed my mission. Kim Soar and I left. I was glad that my memory of Han remained vibrant and, and my visits to, to talk about her death still brought me to tears. It made me even happier to know that these continued pilgrimages to see her family lightened our hearts and softened the pain of loss. Now, that would be the end of a little story, a story that had continued since Han had been injured in a coup, and I was taking Tevi out of Cambodia to safety, and she begged me not to leave her. I was her luck in Cambodia, and I lied and said, I'm going to Singapore and I'll be back. But of course, I knew I wasn't coming back. Han knew I wasn't coming back, but she didn't question me. She let me go. Two weeks later, in her little shop, while I was driving home from Florida with Tevi back to Ohio, my brother called to tell me the news. Han was murdered by one of the soldiers in the coup on the losing side who was then drunk and, you know, trying to get money or whatever. And I knew that had I been in Cambodia, because Han was so seriously injured, I would have been at that shop, exposed just like she was, helping her out. So every time I was back in Cambodia, I would do this. Well, Han's daughter, Mei Mei, lived with Han's parents until she was nine years old. 
her father had been went to France and married a French Khmer, and they kept the little girl for a few years to give the new couple a time to get their marriage worked out, which never worked out, but that's a different story. The last time I saw Mei Mei, she was eight years old, missing two teeth. Her grandmother was worried that I had come to take Mei Mei to America after I had adopted Tevi. What would stop me from taking Mei Mei? I said, no, no, I don't want Mei Mei. She belonged to her father. I'm just checking to make sure. And uh, But Han's mother died. Han's father died. Um, <laughs> Her husband, Hong, was in Paris, and I lost track. And when I would ask the family about them, they really didn't have a lot of information. So for many, many years, I went to see the family, but I had no information about Mei Mei, the little girl who bathed in my bathtub um, with her mother. And then I got home from Cambodia. So I saw Thief in February of 2017. I'm back home. This is now Wednesday, May 3rd, 2017, 7.38 p.m. from May May Kong to Carol Garrison. Oh. Subject, I searched for you a long time. Dear Carol, I don't know if you can remember me, but I remember you because you're my mom's friend. My mom is Ching Hung. I remember one time you come to Cambodia and brought me a dress when I was eight. I am 21 years old now and live in France. I hope we can keep contact and speak together. Much love, Mei Mei Kong. And this is August of 2017, and that's Mei Mei and I outside of Paris. Oh. We sat together, we looked at pictures, she wanted stories, anything to bring her mother back to life. And I still wanted absolution for leaving them. And so um, this is the end of the book. And we actually were able then to put in this postscript to the end of the book. Is it the end of the journey? This is the reason this is in the end of the book, because as long as I am moving and living, I will continue to make stories and share those stories, hoping that those stories will also encourage you to share yours or feel connected to something that's going on that's part of our humanity. So thank you very much for putting up with this very long is short and we generally try to get out of here around 12. Why don't I suggest that uh, Carol hang around and we can approach her and ask our questions and share our comments with her. Um, I don't have my book.